Hello, welcome to our look ahead to what the papers will be bringing us tomorrow. Once again, we're joined by the chief leader writer at The Observer, Sonia Soda, and the chief political commentator at Times Radio, Tom Newton Dunn. Great to have you both with us. We'll have a little bit more time to digest the breaking news from earlier. So let's start with some of the front pages that we have. The Telegraph, it says Sunday has been set as a new deadline after Boris Johnson's trip to Brussels did not result in a Brexit breakthrough. Deadlock at dinner is the front page of the Daily Mail as it reports that large gaps remain following those crunch talks. The Metro reports that fish was on the menu as the Prime Minister and the EU chief Ursula von der Leyen sat down for dinner in the Belgian capital. According to The Times, Boris Johnson was refusing to back down before those crucial talks got underway. Take it or leave it, so says The Express, which reports that the Prime Minister was pushing back against the EU's demand. The Guardian says Boris Johnson set out his red lines before the dinner in Brussels, but it adds that he was insisting a deal was still possible. And the Mirror leading with the news that Tesco has been stockpiling some food as it prepares for a potential shortage in the event of a no-deal Brexit. And the Sun carries a plea for help from pub landlords as the Prime Minister, from, to the Prime Minister as many face tough Covid restrictions in the run-up to Christmas. So those are some of the papers that we have. A lot, of course, responding to the news that we had earlier. So uh, let's start with you, Tom. We've had various different plays on words, deadlock at dinner, meal deals, etc. But uh, all focusing on the three hour long dinner between Boris Johnson and Ursula von der Leyen, which didn't bring out uh, an agreement, but also no no deal as well. So I guess, you know, the talks continue. Talk us through what. Uh, what you reckon and where this, where the sticking points you think are? Well, uh, I suppose you could look at this and say, well, what on earth has changed since yesterday, last week, last month? Uh, supposedly nothing. Uh, or you could look at this and say, well, actually, there has been uh, some interesting moment, or there looks like there has been. We just may not know the detail for a while yet. I think it's glass half empty or glass half full time, depending on your potential outlook on, on life. What do we know? Going into this, there were no talks at all. Uh, tomorrow, there will be talks. In fact, they're going to talk for four more days. We also know that both leaders uh, put out statements, Ursula von der Leyen and the Prime Minister put out statements saying, well, it was a very frosty old conversation, uh, a lively and interesting conversation, said Ursula von der Leyen, and a, a frank conversation, said Boris Johnson. Both of those are diplomatic parlance for how we had a, a, a fairly decent bust up. Uh, and we just didn't see eye to eye at all. And both saying significant gaps still remain. Number 10, sources tonight going further, saying, uh, one telling me that nothing uh, was achieved at all in that room. There was zero progress. The big question I think still remains though, if that is really the case, uh, if they are still at utter loggerheads over these sort of crucial areas of fishing and level playing field, what are they doing talking for four more days? There is surely zero point uh, in sitting in a room staring at each other, David Frost and Michel Obama doing that again for four more days if they're just still log jammed, if there is nothing new put into that uh, conversation. Unless they're just trying to uh, not be the first one to get up and walk away from the table and not be the first one to look like they cause no deal. It just feels to me though, four days is a long time. Those two men, David Frost and Michelle Barney, remember those talks had to stop because they simply ran out of things to talk about because they were so log jammed. It feels to me that they're going to give this perhaps one last shot now at trying something, trying something to bridge that gap. And I think it is on level playing field, the difference between the Britain's position on uh, a non-aggression clause, which is basically agreeing to not worsen current standards on you know, labour, marketplace, uh, environmental protection, state aid and the EU's position, which is um, penalty clauses if Britain diverges away from future EU positions. So it, it feels like there is a chance here of achieving something. It may come to nothing. Uh, it may just be another charade, but I personally can't see them continuing this four days longer unless at least they thought there was something there. What do you reckon, Sonia? Is it is it this idea about the level playing fields? Because of course, with with fish, you can potentially, you know, th th there is the stats. You can come to some sort of agreement. Is that is the level playing fields? There's future positions. If they don't come to a deal, then there will be no future positions, future tariffs, etc., to discuss anyway. But what what do you reckon? What's your thinking? 
Yeah, I absolutely think it's a level playing field. And this is the issue that has been at the heart of the divisions uh, between, and um, you know, the wide gap that there's been between the EU and the UK on Brexit since the very, very beginning of the process. And there is this thing which is that, um, you know, the, the people in the Conservative Party who are very hardline about, about it, the Brexiteers, the ERG, they really wanted us to leave the EU and have a so-called clean break. So we don't have to, you know, abide by any sort of EU regulations. We have complete sovereignty over our own laws. The problem is, is that that's just not a realistic proposition in a 21st century world where um, a country of our size strikes trade deals with countries around the world. Trade deals are always based, particularly when they're on countries and trading blocks very close to you, on some degree of alignment around standards. So this is really where the whole process has come unstuck. The EU says, we've got our standards. If you want to diverge from them, you know, you're know you free to do that once you've left um, the EU. Uh, but it means that we will need to introduce trade barriers and tariffs. If you don't want those trade barriers to be in place and those tariffs to be in place, um, you know you have to align your standards with our standards. So that is where, where where the issue has always been. It feels like there's still a very big gap between the EU and the UK on it. I can't see the EU budging because the EU has to protect the integrity of the single market. Um, and, and so I really think the question here is, is that last time Boris Johnson said he would never ever cross any of his red lines um, was was at the time when he was negotiating a withdrawal agreement with the EU. And actually, he, he saw his red line and in order to get that withdrawal agreement in the end, he stepped right across it. So, um, you know, he said he would not um, have Northern Ireland sort of, he would, that, you know, there would be no border or checks down the Irish Sea. In the end, Boris Johnson conceded that to the EU. Uh, for the withdrawal agreement. So I think the question really this time is, is, is Boris Johnson, when he's saying he's got these red lines, are they absolute or is he willing to give somewhat and to come to some agreement with the EU about some kind of mechanism for if, you know, if the UK and the EU diverge in labour and environmental standards, for example, in the future, what that means in terms of um, trade barriers. That, I think, is a really, really massive question at the heart of this. And to be honest, although we're seeing all these theatrics and, you know, these dinners, etc., and these conversations, I imagine the Prime Minister does have, and David Frost, they do sort of have an idea in their heads about whether they are going to reach a compromise with the EU at the very last minute or not. It's just that it's very hard for us to see as observers from the outside, I think, um, of whether they're going to do that. And the Daily Telegraph also, uh, of course, focusing on this. Uh, they're looking at these, uh, particularly highlighting the four days that, Tom, you were talking about. You know, what are they going to be talking about uh, over these four days? The Prime Minister's Downing Street's official statement is saying that the Prime Minister determined not to leave any route to a fair deal untested, but any agreement must respect the independence and sovereignty of the UK. Tom, what's your reading then? Can you have a deal and still respect that? I mean, ultimately, you know, we've been talking about this particular thing for years. Yeah, we, we have been. And that's what's so interesting about the, the current dynamic is that the thing that they're really stuck on, I don't really think it is fishing at the moment. There does seem to be ways through. Michael Gove this morning was talking about how the UK is prepared to compromise on fishing. It, it's really just agreeing a set of numbers. Uh, how many fish can be fished, uh, how many boats, etc. And you can do that uh, once it's a basic haggle. Level playing field is a far bigger ideological divide between the two sides. It's all about, as Boris Johnson might say, can Britain have its cake and eat it? Can it continue trading with the EU without tariffs or quotas at the same time as uh, going off and doing what it wants, uh, having total sovereignty to decide pretty much everything it wants to in terms of its own market regulations or should it have to agree some level playing field of standards uh, so it can trade fairly with the EU? That's going to be the EU's viewpoint. And, and that's been the huge ide ideological divide, really, between Brexit, Brexiteers and Remainers, uh, the EU and Boris Johnson, Theresa May's government, uh, since this debate began five years ago. It still isn't resolved. The question is, over the next four days, you know, was there something that happened in that room tonight that made them think, this is worth giving it another shot? Why else? you set a four-day time limit? Why not just give it 24 hours? Why not give it one hour for that matter? 
or uh, are they going to be unable to resolve that gap between a non-regression pact, which is what Boris Johnson wants on level playing field standards, uh, and some penalty clauses that the EU wants to impose if, if the UK diverges too much in, in their point of view. Now, it doesn't feel like, uh, I think he put this to the man on the street and said, well, you know, we can only get a non-regression pact, uh, they wouldn't give us, uh, they, they, they insist on, we, we couldn't get a non-regression pact, they insisted on uh, dynamic alignment. That is an argument very hard to sell to the man on the street. And I think for there to be no deal at the end of the day, for the EU to turn around to its 400 million citizens and Britain to turn around to its 66 million and say, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's fallen on this. It's a difficult thing to sell to nigh on 500 million people. So it still feels to me that they will attempt to bridge this. They'll come up with a fudge because that, that is what the EU is really good at. You know, they do fudge things spectacularly and that's how deals end up being done. But, you know, I may be wrong. Um, we've only got four more days to wait now, we think unless they push that deadline further down the line, of course, as well. Well, according to a government source, uh, Sunday will be a firm end point today to decide. So in, in theory, that's a, a, a real deadline. But when in practice, you know, the FT is talking about a story that focuses on the real, real deadline, which is, of course, the 31st of December, Sonia, when without a deal, things will change hugely. And uh, according to the FT, they've got a European Commission source telling them that Britain's could be barred from entering the EU. Yes, yeah, so if we leave with no deal, there's going to be huge disruption, I think, in so many areas. And this FT story is focusing on one of them in particular. So um, at the moment, the EU um, has a list of uh, sort of approved countries to, you know, from which people can come into the EU during the global pandemic. And it's a quite discreet list of countries. And all of those countries have very, very low rates of infection. So we're talking countries like Singapore and New Zealand. Um, and not every EU country allows in uh, residents from all of those countries on the safe list. Now, if you're part of the EU, obviously, you're that you're, you're, you're excluded from those provisions. So, and because the UK has been part of the, uh, you know, during the transition period, we sort of carried on in a steady state. Those rules have not applied to us. And today we've got, or tomorrow we've got a commission, EU commission source saying that actually, if there's no deal and there's no agreement, the UK will be subject to exactly the same limitations on our citizens and residents going into the EU uh, that they would be for any other third country who's outside the EU. EU and there are a number of quite stringent tests you have to meet, um, uh, you have to meet to get onto that safe list. So I think this will be worrying to anybody who is sort of planning a holiday, uh, maybe in the first half of next year. Although obviously there's just so much uncertainty anyway with the pandemic, um, but it's a lot of uncertainty. I mean, hopefully that situation wouldn't come to pass, even if there was a no deal. Perhaps that would be in place for say a month or two, and you would hope that there would be some sort of reciprocal arrangement reached but um it you know it's it's it, i think it just goes to show how much uncertainty there is like how uncertain the world would look like in terms of the relationship between the eu and the uk if we do leave the transition period without a deal on the first of, of january and you think just as people are, are looking at the vaccines and uh, the, the potential of revisiting other countries again and uh, and yeah you've got something like this let's move on to the guardian now and tom it's got uh, what happened during uh, the last election, the red wall, that uh, the Labour red wall that got completely crushed by um, by the Conservatives. I was up in Darlington actually for the election programme and that, that was one of the constituencies that went uh, to the Conservatives. Um, what's, what is the, the, this is a study and what is it warning um, about what could potentially happen in terms of, of these former Labour heartlands? Well, it's a study drawn up by some Labour MPs, uh, I think reinforcing what a lot of uh, current Labour MPs and actually former Labour MPs were saying who lost their seats across these uh, red wall areas in, in the north, uh, the Midlands, northeast, northwest. Uh, that Labour has effectively seen in these red wall seats, 50 or so, remember, that went from uh, Labour to Tory in the December general election. Labour is seen as out of touch with those voters. They don't share their values anymore. Uh, they're ineffective. And Labour just simply doesn't represent them. And clearly, in those rebel seats, that's what happened. Uh, certainly, Brexit was one issue. Uh, Boris Johnson, obviously, getting Brexit done was his slogan of that election. But also, a little bit more of a, perhaps a, a culture war and an identity war going on as well. 
those more traditional working class, formerly Labour voters, simply not thinking that what was very much sort of a, a London-centric Labour Party at the time, remember most of the shadow cabinet's leadership was made up of London MPs, Jeremy Corbyn, Emily Thornberry, Keir Starmer, all of them, North London MPs, in fact, not even uh, all over London, just one part of London. Uh, and this report says unless Labour really starts appealing uh, to red wall voters or blue barricade voters, now as the Tories would like to call them, uh, those seats are lost forever. And without them, there's no chance of Labour ever really getting majority, with, certainly with the party's state in Scotland being as, as, as dire as it is. So that's why I think you're already seeing Keir Starmer going big on things like defence. Fascinating, he backed an extra £16 billion of spending on defence. Uh, we saw in the spending review a couple of weeks ago, wholeheartedly, uh, issues like you know the flag, patriotism, stuff that really matters in red wall seats and has huge resonance. I think we'll see Labour talking huge amounts about that now uh, coming up. How believable they, they come across is a different matter, but they'll certainly have huge amounts of evidence because they know those sort of cultural issues really, really matter in winning those sort of seats back in 2024. Um, we've got one more paper left, but Sonia, just get your perspective. What do you reckon? Can Labour do it? Can they regain these seats? I think a lot of it actually depends on which the territory uh, on which the 2024 general election is fought. And there's so much uncertainty about what's going to happen in the next three years, particularly to the economy. So I think one of the interesting things about um, Labour voters in some of these areas is if you look at the polling, they tend to be closer to Conservatives on social issues, um, some of them, not all of them, obviously that's like a, a massive generalisation, but there's a tendency, and they tend to be obviously much closer to the Labour Party on economic issues, and that's why I think Keir Starmer is really going to want to fight the 2024 general election on the economy and how the economy is doing, um, and you know, it feels like we've got we've had the impact of the global pandemic um, we've got brexit coming down the track even a, a, a brexit with a free trade deal is going to have a bigger impact economists think on the economy than the pandemic which is absolutely huge so i think there's a good chance that the next three years are going to feel really grim economically you're going to see unemployment go up people losing their jobs it's just not going to feel great um for families and um so you know, if that happens, I think Labour will probably be looking to fight the general election on the state of the economy and the Conservatives letting people down. Whereas I think Boris Johnson is going to want to keep the election more focused on the sort of culture wars issues. And we've seen that very much in some, some of the fights that he's picked over uh, the last few months in terms of kind of, um, you know, asylum seekers coming to the UK, um, uh, sort of, you know, picking fights with anti racist racism protesters, for example. So he wants to sort of foment division and um, pick a fight and fight the election on more kind of social cultural issues. And so I think that's, that's you know, I think a lot is up for grabs in 2024, but so much is going to depend on the state of the economy. And a lot is going to depend on whether those voters who voted Labour in 2015 and Conservative in 2019, what do they decide to do? And I think a big chunk of that will depend on what happens to the economy. OK, well, you touched upon culture in a few sentences, Tom, uh, on The Times. What has Cambridge University voted to do in particular regarding no platforming? Uh, a big vote by uh, Don's, uh, the academics, overturning a bid by the university to effectively uh, ban uh, no platforming. So no platforming will no longer be allowed. The, the idea that the university students, unions, etc. will be able to shut down people whose views they no longer agree with. They'll be able to stop them from talking. That they can no longer do. Now, it's called the respect agenda, but the Times has it, this is a victory for free speech because if you can't shut people down anymore whose views you might find offensive or may, it might not be woke or politically correct or whatever the terminology is, that means free speech uh, wins, even though you don't like uh, what speech it is they're being free to express. So a victory against potentially what some might describe as woke tonight. Now, I am not in any way, shape or form shutting either of you down, but I am being told we are running out of time. So as always, thank you so much for talking us through uh, today's big events or rather, well, yeah, no, no, no news. But well, we'll find out on Sunday what happens next. Uh, Sonia, Tom, thank you so much. Have a good rest of the evening, what is left. And as always, thank you to all of our viewers on the papers and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching.